Well, again, good morning to everyone, and welcome to our session here on um, inclusivity and menu choice. Who of you have, uh, uh, if for you, this is the first session in here, in this place? Good, just about all of you. That's good, because then I need to do my introduction to explain where you are. Because this is um, the, the place where uh, IAC, the organization that has set up this, uh, this, this, not a booth, we call it a showcase. And it's not the meeting room of the future, but it is the showcase for the meeting room of the future. So what we're doing here is we're building on the research that IAC has done, um, gauging the opinions of meeting planners on what's going to happen in the next three to five years in meetings. And we're exploring where that is taking us. So for today's session, for instance, um, we're going to focus on food choices. And we're, um, we're seeing, of course, that there's a, a lot of increasing individualization of people who want food choices in, uh, in, uh, in meetings and, and, and conferences. Now, with that comes um, a different kind of issue that you need to face, which is how can you make these people feel that they are actually part of the same experience as the people who don't have those special menu needs. Um, we see the trend increasing. We see that there is going to be more of this, more, in, more need for individualization. Knowledge about food is increasing. Knowledge about people's own physiology is increasing. And as a result of that, um, all of the diets that people would like, to, would like to have respected when they come to a conference and a, uh, a meeting, um, they would like also at the same time to continue to have the feeling that they are part of the same group and part of the same, of the same event that's happening. We've got two, mainly two ways in which we're going to share some ideas with you about that. One is um, in the form of our panel, whom I'm going to introduce in a second. And the other one is in the form of food. So um, not right now, maybe, but when the session is over, um, I'd like you to, be, to taste the food. We've got the two chefs who are part of the panel who can explain why they've made those choices of foods and ingredients um, in terms of sustainability and dietary needs of um, a lar large groups of participants. Um, so in here, we're going to explore today together what that means for menu choices. Um, my name is Mike van der Weyver. I've designed, together with Mark Cooper, who's in the back there of IAC, we've designed the experience in here. For the session, we're going to use Slido. Is everybody already familiar with how to use Slido? You just go to slido.com, and then you tap on, uh, what's, it, what's it called, Clara? IAC? IAC meeting room, you tap on that, and then you will get the questions for this session. In a, but we're going to do that in a second, so if necessary, I'll explain again. You also have access through the conference app, by the way. OK. We have asked our three panelists to come up with their best possible uh, menu in terms of inclusivity and sustainability as they see things today. They're going to explain those menus to you, and then uh, you will have the opportunity to ask them questions about that. The second thing we're going to do in the second half of the session, we have asked three conference venues, which are part of IAC, the IAC group, the IAC association, to submit three menus that they use today. And we're going to pick those apart nicely, but we're going to pick them apart. Um, we're going to ask the panelists to say, what are some of the things that they've done that you like, that you think is useful? What are some of the things where you see room for improvement? And all of that will build your knowledge around um, how you can make the best menu choices together with your uh, with your participants. OK, that's the plan for this morning. Next is, obviously, our panel. So we have oh. Maria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, please do. Yeah, 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 okay. stand up Hello. so people can see you. Yes, good. Maria McElraith, she's the Director of Industry Advancement with Events Industry Council. We have Felix Mayetta, who's sitting there. Um, he's the uh, Food and Beverage Executive Chef with Sodexo Conferencing. Probably many of you know the name of Sodexo. And we've got Murray Hall, who is the executive chef with the Bank of Montreal Conference Centre here in Canada. So um, highly knowledgeable panel, and I'm going to hand over straight to them. The first is Mariella. Mariella, you're going to explain yes. why you chose this highly, uh, highly inclusive menu. OK. And it looks great, by the way. I well, really love those pictures. Let me say that when I heard that I was presenting a, 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 a menu, and I looked at who I was presenting with, I'm like, OK, this is, this is going to be bad, because my kids know me for my tuna casserole and my avocado toast, and there's a reason for that. 
So I am, uh, I'm not known as the best chef in the, in, the, uh, in the world, but I do have some good ideas and some good insights uh, about sustainability and about some of the things that we can improve on. Uh, and I also have some very good friends in the industry, so I absolutely cheated. I reached out to another chef and I said, help me because I am, you know, I've got good ideas, but I'm going to be absolutely embarrassed if I try to come up with something and present it next to these two gentlemen. So, so I cheated. Um, and I was so impressed. I got back a 20-slide presentation, and you're going to get to see three of them. But uh, what I'd like you to do is... Uh, is just close your eyes for a second. And I'm going to walk you through, not the menu, but first the food experience. So what we have here is we're at, at the hotel poolside. And in the pool are boats that are bringing dishes to the poolside and being received by the chef and brought to the table. The entire experience is going to be family style. So there will be, you'll be sharing food. There'll be many small dishes that are brought. I'll be clear, not every dish will meet everyone's needs, but everyone's needs will be met. So I'm gonna show you three of the many dishes now. So if you wanna open your eyes. The first one that we have here is a vegetarian green curry with seasonal garden vegetables. Um, now this, is, uh, this has been selected because vegetarian menus typically will have a better uh, environmental footprint in terms of water usage and carbon emissions. Uh, it's all seasonal. And the nice thing is here is that you're also able to use the whole vegetable. A lot of times we are uh, throwing things away or we're, we're very focused on perfect looking foods. Uh, a great thing about soups and curries is that once you cut things up, you're using much more of the, of the items than otherwise. So it's a fresh, uh, tasty, sustainable uh, option here with the, with the green curry. Uh, the next one is um, a fish intestine soup. Now, I think you're going to be like, what? But I want you to th remember that we actually eat intestines with other, uh, with other uh, animals regularly. If you're having sausage, what's it encased in, right? So we have to start thinking a little bit differently about using the whole animal if we're going to be uh, consuming meat products and fish products. Uh, this is a sustainably sourced, um, sourced fish that, that, they've, uh, that they've found for this menu as well. And like I said, it is using the entire fish. So they're using the, f the fish bones to make the stock. And that's, it's a great flavor enhancer. Um, I'd encourage you to do that. There are also some other uh, items that they brought in, including a uh, fried rice that's made with leftovers uh, from, from previous menus. And it can be cu customized to be uh, to vegan or any other um, needs that you might have. It's gluten-free as well. Uh, oh, yeah, this is the leftovers fried rice salad here. So um, they've been able to customize it. Again, the chef is going to be coming to the table and actually speaking with everyone to find out what are your dietary needs. And as uh, the, the chef is presenting the, the, the menu, uh, he, she, or they will, will explain whether or not that, uh, that particular dish is going to meet each of the individual people's uh, needs. Uh, and then we're going to uh, wrap it up with a toasted butter brioche uh, bread, uh, pandan custard, and fresh young coconut. Uh, so again, this is uh, this is a great way of using up uh, leftover breads. Um, it, you know, bread puddings are quite well known, uh, but so this is another alternative. And uh, a little bit of uh, local uh, local chocolate and uh, and coffee to wrap things up at the end. So this is uh, also t ties in with the brain friendly elements. We're starting to learn more and more about the brain gut connection. And this is an important thing for us to be aware of because your serotonin levels, the, the things that affect your moods and how happy you are, are completely controlled in your gut. So we want to make sure that we're introducing things that people are eating throughout the day that are going to fill them with energy, help them to focus and be able to better participate, and, uh, and, and really get the most out of that experience. Um, as we design our food menus, we're also making choices that enhance participant performance. So I do want you to start thinking more about those brain-friendly options, those, uh, those lean proteins, uh, reduced sugar options as well, and really making sure that they're getting the most out of it. So again, I, I, I will completely admit that this was not my menu. I'm so grateful to Chef Daniel from the, uh, the uh, Marriott Queens Park in Bangkok who helped uh, present, put this all together. Uh, he's, uh, he's also been really focused on reducing food waste uh, in the operations and has made some incredible 
uh, credible um, headway with introducing um, ingredients that aren't usually uh, used. So some of the things that we would typically discard, which we need to really change. The amount of food waste that is thrown out uh, in society is, has to be addressed. Um, and and we're, we're going to help make that happen through events, right? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana. There is immediately a question from the gentleman oh, over here. So, yes. yeah. Could I have the handheld mic? Thank you. Yep. Um, are we going to be able to get these, the presentation yep. emailed yes. to us? Yep. Uh, yep, Matthew, can, make that. can you, can you make a note them? of that? Make, make presentations available, please. Yeah, okay, good, we'll do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions about any of the ingredients or any of the choices in Mariella's menu? Yes. Yes. When you're looking at a menu uh, in that capacity and you're suggesting that a chef would be bringing it, what size group would you be looking at? Well, I think that you could do that with, with any size group. The, the, uh, the parameters that we were given for this uh, exercise was for a 40-person event. Um, but you can still have, if it's not the chef, then having some of the, the staff come by and talking to people and making sure that you're making, making the right decisions. That communication po point is, um, is critical for, for being able to meet dietary needs. Uh, so you need to have a way of collecting the information, making sure that the people that are working at the event um, are able to identify the people that have dietary needs, or, um, or that if people are needing to go somewhere specific to collect their meals, that they are made aware of that in advance. Uh, that's where you can run into some really big food waste issues if um, people don't know where to collect their food. That often very expensive, you know, customized meals get thrown out and the person that ordered them is, uh, is left hungry. So, yeah. Okay. Good. Anybody else? No? Yes. Uh, I would like to make one point that I found out in a different seminar in, down in the U.S., all of these things are now under the ADA. So if you're planning a large event and somebody gets sick because you didn't ask them what their dietary thing was, you could be sued. Okay. Uh, yeah, ADA? Yes. Um, food allergies are considered um, uh, under the American uh, Immigrants with Disabilities Act. And so it is something that we need to, to be aware of as our responsibilities. Uh, but you know, in addition to our legal responsibilities, we also have uh, a duty to create welcoming environments, right? So over and above that, um, when we think about hospitality, we are very much rooted in creating something where people are feeling invited and welcomed and, uh, and you know, meeting their needs is a part of that. The legal issue is just the, the sort of the minimum, it, minimum threshold. That's a minimum threshold, absolutely. Okay. Good, thanks. Okay. That was one. Oh, there, last oh, question. Okay. I want to make sure. <laughs> Talk about you. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, hello. <laughs> I have a, a rather quite practical question. I mean, if you ask participants about their need, how much time do you need to then cater for the need? I mean, do you have dishes ready which cater for each need, or do you prepare it according to, to your answers? I mean, how is the process for this? Yeah. I, I'm going to defer to the chefs here to... to yeah, sure, no problems. Uh, what we do is we would have definitely an amount of uh, gluten-free, vegetarian meals is set aside or whatever dietary allergies would be listed ahead of time, we would have that set aside. Um, so, but yeah, I can go into more detail with, uh, with my slide as well, too, on some of the new ideas we're coming up with, too. <coughs> okay, well, why don't you take the oh, first right away? Yeah. No, no problems. Like a, thank you for providing okay. me that seamless uh, yeah, connection. No so okay. that was a great intro, yeah, thank you. Well, well done. <clears throat> yeah. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, again, my name is Murray Hall. I'm the executive chef of the Bank of Montreal Conference Center here in Toronto. And a couple of things that comes back to me is who here has a budget, right? Mm? Everybody's got a budget. Mm? Who, who likes to pay a little more for that vegan meal? <laughs> Nobody, mm? right? So the main thing what we have is we've got gluten-free, dairy-free, and we've got vegan, we've got vegetarian on the rise. Mm? So we've looked at a holistic approach of saying, well, let's not, let's not be entirely vegan, let's not be entirely vegetarian, let's be plant forward. Let's use the whole plants, as Marinola is going to. Let's use uh, making sure we're cutting down the proteins, we're cutting down uh, the, sh the, the salt, the sugar, uh, the fats, and really utilizing that whole dish and that whole uh, plate. But also customizing our menus to say, if we've got vegans and vegetarians in the group, well, we can have a vegan salad. We can have a vegan dessert. I can have 
an entree which has which I can easily take the chicken breast off and put a piece of tofu or a piece of tempeh or something onto that to make that vegan. But the rest of the dish would be vegan and vegetarian. So just an example would be the salad. It's a butter lettuce salad with falafel crumbles, a little bit of roasted cauliflower, avocado, grapes, cucumbers, spearmint popped amaranth seeds, and it's all vegan, gluten-free. So <clears throat> nobody ever asked me where the gluten is, right? Nobody ever asked me where the dairy is. Everybody asked me where is dairy free? Where is gluten free? So by incorporating that into the menus, I'm doing two things. I'm cutting down the cost. I'm absorbing that cost. So you're not gonna pay extra to have a gluten free, vegan friendly meal. It's just gonna be incorporated. And I'll tell you the meat eaters out there, I'm, trust me, I'm a meat eater, right? I love bacon as much as the next person does, but uh, I happily have a salad. It's a great tasting salad. The dessert as well too. Well, instead of making that with dairy and with stuff, let's, let's make it vegan. Uh, dessert is an aquafob uh, mousse, which is chickpea. Uh, the juice of chickpeas are stored in cans. That whips up fantastic. A little bit of icing sugar and you're off to the races. And also looking at concentrating flavors. Blueberries, ginger, strong flavors, nice relish in there. We have a mint matcha and Nanaimo bar as well, too. So something a little bit iconic Canadian. You know, the Nanaimo bars have been around forever. I, I still love them, but let's change that and let's make that vegan. So let's have dates, let's have nuts in that. Let's have a vegan chocolate on top of that. And it's gonna be palatable for everybody, but we're also ticking a box so that if someone is, has a dietary concern, they wanna have um, something a little bit out of the ordinary, we're addressing the wow factor. We're making sure that people are feeling inclusive with the menus as well, and they can come back. And there's nobody gonna wait and say, Oh, I need that special dairy-free meal. Just you get it like everybody else, and it's a much more welcoming environment. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing we've looked at with a lot of our menus and just address that holistically versus saying, here's the dairy-free plates that's going to cost me extra money. Here's the gluten-free plates that's going to cost. We lump it all in together, and we have that. So it goes out together for the group, and we've had some great responses from it. Marie, I see lemon aquafaba mousse. Uh, am I the yep. only person who has no idea what this is? If everybody, everybody knows, I'm fine, but otherwise yeah, okay. it would be good to explain. Good, that's great. Catch up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. but, yep, question. One question is... Um, yeah, just a second. Yeah, so everybody can hear. Sorry. Um, one, one request that I always get is, because I have so many vegans in my group, is salads are not enough that they need some protein, they need something else on there, what would you add to a salad? Uh, the salad I had today was popped amaranth seeds, which is, a, which is a complete protein, and that is something that we do keep in mind with all our dishes. Even on the entree, we'd add a, a tofu or a tempeh, which is a protein component, but also look at putting a grain in as well too, which could be a quinoa, could be, um, again, an amaranth, something that would be a complete protein, a hemp seed as well too, because I get exactly the same request, is where am I getting my protein? and uh, making that front and center. But also I find when it comes to a lot of vegan and vegetarians, they really want to know what they're having. So I tend to put a lot more detail in the menus as what's listed there, because everybody can look at it and go, okay, this is, I know what I'm getting, versus a baby lettuce salad with roasted cauliflower. Well, that can be kind of anything, so what am I really getting? And that addresses the protein question as well. Thank you. Next question. Uh, regarding the protein at the source of like uh, ingredient, uh, because right now uh, they are the insect, just as like bug, uh, like cricket, as well mm. as like silkworm. Because like uh, Marina, you just shown about food in Thailand. Yeah. In fact, I'm from Thailand, okay. and there uh, a lot of people about we would say that about thirty percent they are familiar with fried insect. And right now, they are also like uh, insects that are break and also have been approved by HACCP, uh, so it's safe. However, I'm unsure uh, whether or not the chef would like to put insect as part of the normal food for the conference. For, I don't know, I mean, this is my, my thing. I, I tend to draw a line on bugs. Okay, <laughs> that, that's just kind of me. I've had my fair share of deep fried cockroaches and all, and all those crickets and everything. It is actually something that is coming, becoming quite popular. Uh, I have not myself had any requests for it uh, as an as alternative protein out there. Uh, I don't know if Felix, if you had anything request on that. Um, no, but we um, 
at Sodexo, uh, or we, we do the food service at Safeco Field in Seattle, and they've just introduced um, insects, I think it's crickets, and where you can purchase, you know, like you're going to purchase popcorn, you can purchase a bag of bugs. Bag of bugs. A bag of bugs. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, <laughs> actually, sounds quite attractive. A bag of bugs sounds good. In favor of it. Um, we do need to start looking at alternative protein sources that are lower uh, in, you know, on an environmental impact uh, front. Um, crickets are, um, I've had some really good protein bars that are made with crickets. Uh, you do have to have one note of caution, and that is that crickets have an exoskeleton, which means that they, um, similar to shellfish, there are people that will have uh, allergies to those. So if someone has a shellfish allergy, they may not be aware of the fact that they're, they are also likely uh, allergic to crickets. So you have to make sure that you're taking that into consideration. Um, but I think it's also a generational, you know, we, we need a shift uh, from our expectations. I mean, if you look at a lobster, those things are scary looking. Like, what, if you t take a second to think, wow, what was somebody thinking the first time somebody you know, ate a lobster? And it's the same sort of reaction that we're having today with crickets. Like, you know, when you start to incorporate it into your diet and you see it on a regular basis, you know, maybe crickets will be the lobster of the future and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll come to appreciate them for, for what let, they are. Let, let's, do, let's sound it out with the audience. Could you, could you all stand up, please? Just a very quick way of sounding it out. <laughs> okay, please. Okay, now um, we'll start with whole bugs. Okay, so if uh, like the, the, the bag of bugs, if you if you <laughs> would you be willing to buy or buy or eat at a at a conference a bag of bugs for uh, for a meal? If you don't, please sit down. <laughs> okay, stand good. Up. Now um, <laughs> please stand up again because now we're going to do now we're going to do. Suppose the, the bugs are become an ingredient. They're ground. It's like a flour. It's like a high-protein flour. And you can use the high-protein flour in dishes. OK, would you now be willing to uh, consider this as an ingredient for a dish that you would eat? If you don't, sit down. If I didn't know about it, sure. No? If, OK. <laughs> yeah, but that's cheating. <laughs> hey, I'm all for cheating. <laughs> OK, if you, if you did know about it, right? So as an ingredient, there's a much higher acceptance rate that, that shows this, this, little, um, this little survey. Thank you. OK, last question here before I move on to you, Felix. Yes, you mentioned the liquid from the chickpeas. Yes. Um, can you expand more on the applications for that and the nutritional value? Yeah, the nutritional value is, is, is great. It is uh, dairy-free, it's gluten-free, uh, and it is vegan as well. But it's, the chickpeas always have a taste. Mm. So if you take the mousse, it's fantastic. You more or less take it out, chill it, put it into your uh, mixer as you would regular whipped cream, whip it up, a little bit of cream of tartar, it foams up. You do need a little bit of icing sugar into it to just kind of cut that chickpea flavor out of it a little bit. But honestly, it whips up like whipped cream, and you can pipe it, and you can mold it as well. So it's, it's a really fantastic alternative, and I find that vegans out there really appreciate that extra step. And then if someone who's not vegan, they look at, whoa, this is kind of interesting. What's going on here? And uh, they're a little bit excited about it, too. OK, great. No problem. And Felix is nodding in agreement, so both chefs yep. perfectly agree. Felix, and now it's, new, it's your turn. It's my turn? Yep. Here you go. OK, great. You're an inclusive menu. <laughs> yeah, so I don't have to put my glasses on. You okay, so um, <laughs> you'll notice the first thing off is that I offer two choices, um, <laughs> whether it's a group of 40 or a group of 400. Um, I'm a firm believer in, in, in inclusivity in menus. Just as diversity and inclusion is important to any corporate culture, it has its place in food and beverage as well. People from all walks of life, all countries, all dietary needs, um, you are embraced <clears throat> because you are an individual and, and, and we're in hospitality and, and we need to put our hospitality foot forward all the time. So in my operation, in, in, in Sodexo Conferencing, we really are embracing um, people from all walks, you know, whether you um, have a dietary need or a different ethnicity. Uh, we do a lot of... Um, I mean, I'm out of Wilmington, Delaware, so we have every major bank um, as a client. And so it's a very diverse um, group of folks that come to us on a regular basis. So I need to be well versed not only in the dietary needs, uh, but also in some ethnic cuisine as well. So when we talk about uh, inclusion, 
in, in menus. It's, it's, it's greater than just vegan, vegetarian, and gluten-free. It's being able to uh, welcome everybody and, and, you know, we speak through food in a, in a lot of ways. And we provide opportunities for networking and uh, opportunities for people to come together as cultures and, and, and exchange ideas. So that's all a part of it for me. So in my menu, um, our first course of arugula, roasted golden beet salad, charred red onions, chickpea croutons, and with a champagne vinaigrette. Uh, a very colorful salad. Um, being where I am in Wilmington, Delaware, it's growing season for all the great farms in New Jersey. So the arugula is local, the beets are local, the ch uh, red onions are local. Um, so it's a great uh, opportunity for me to really embrace the local foods of the area. And we had this discussion yesterday, Murray and I, you know, we we're talking about, well, what's local and, you know, what can you get locally in, uh, in Canada? Yeah, you know, in, in the winter, and yeah, you said, yeah, yeah, snow and ice, <laughs> snow and ice. <laughs> so, and yeah. it's the same thing in you know in the states yes. in Pennsylvania. You know, we have seasonal. So, and, and you have to be careful. You know, they throw that. A lot of people throw that term local around. You know, pretty loosely. So, in 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 where I'm at, so local could be anything within 400 miles of where I'm at. So, you know, that's that that. Jersey blueberry that you think you're getting may be coming from Michigan, so it's really not local. So we really want to focus on what's in season. Uh, the, uh, my entree, uh, the fennel crusted salmon fillet, sustainable, responsibly raised. Uh, I use warm uh, local heirloom tomatoes when they're in season, Brussels sprouts, um, also make a really great sweet potato hash. So that menu can be interchangeable. You know, so if, if you're vegan or vegetarian, I can just take out that fennel crusted salmon and I can replace it with something plant based or plant forward. So, and that's the mentality that we have in my kitchen. You know, we want to be able to, all the menus that we do, how can we make them dietary friendly? So I'm not reinventing the wheel every time, you know, we have a, a, a conference or a special request. It's just woven into the fabric of what we do and how we think. Um, and I offer a, a vegetarian entree, the, uh, and this is just one of them. It's a Dijon and panko crusted roast cauliflower steak um, with a romesco sauce, wilted down some baby spinach, brown rice risotto, and again, it checks almost all the boxes. And we offer this um, second menu choice on a regular basis because people want options. And you know, a lot of times what happens is I order the salmon and they see the roasted cauliflower steak come out and they're like, oh, that looks great. I'm, and we want to. We want you to be able to do that without feeling like you're taking food off of somebody else. Well, we only, you know, the only order eight, so we made ten. When they're gone, they're gone. You know, that doesn't happen. You know, we we had a, an event last week for 400 people, and 20 percent of the group took the vegetarian options, and we only had maybe a dozen pre-ordered. So we know in our minds that this is the wave of the future, that people. Um, are in a setting where, hey, I'm going to get crazy and I'm going to try that. That looks great. Or I only thought that, you know, vegetarians, I'm going to get a bowl of bland pasta with some peas and, and, and stuff in it. And that's, you know, you're treated like a second class citizen. And that can't happen anymore. You know, and diversity and inclusion in food and beverage um, is just as important, again, as it is in a corporate culture because everybody should feel welcomed and everybody should be taken care of. It's hospitality. Okay, lovely, Felix. Thank you. Yes, question. How do we change the industry where both vendors and planners are thinking um, in this capacity where um, the menus are, we'll start to see menu changes where the menus, we're, we're no longer offering a continental breakfast, for example, which is probably one of the most non-inclusive menus yep. that you can offer. Any of you three? Well, I think that I think that you're starting to see changes now. At least I know in, in my world you are because it's um, it's it's the way that we're we're going to be doing business in the future. You know the the, need, the needs of the many often outweigh the needs of the few, right? So when we talk about diversity and inclusion, that's got to get thrown out the window that so that everybody's needs are met. And so um, I don't know about you, Murray, but. Yeah, I mean, uh, what we're doing now is we're actually changing our typical continental breakfast, which is your croissants, your Danish, your, 
you know, items and we're actually expanding it out. We, we actually wind up calling it with uh, Dolce Hotels and Resorts as nourishment hubs. So we have gluten-free items. Actually, a lot of items are actually listed behind us as well, too. So gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan items as well, low sugar, uh, low salt items. So it really creates, it expands that buffet. It expands the experience. And it all, not only with food, also with beverage as well. I mean, there's still that person that's going to go and have a Coke at 6 o'clock in the morning because that's what they want. But someone else could go by and say, you know, I'm going to try the flavored water today. I'm going to have the iced tea today. I'm going to have something a little bit different today. And I find offering more options within those breaks tends to give a lot more appreciation for what you're doing. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. I'll take one last question from the lady over here and then we need to move on, or you need to move on, rather. I just wanted to ask about waste. He said he had a, a, a meal of 400 people. He had 12 pre-ordered vegetarian, 20 wanted the vegetarian. How do you manage the expectation and the waste of the food that isn't Yeah, that is not, it's not going to be good, good because our people prefer the vegetarian option, <laughs> yeah. Felix? Well, you know, we have a lot of experience and, and we have a lot of repeat business, so we know our groups pretty well, and I think that's really important. Um, but I never worry about too much food going to waste. I have a, a, a very large staff, so oftentimes, the, you know, we over-prepare by about 2%, knowing that counts could go up, could go down, people show up, they don't show up. So. Um, a lot of it goes to, to staff meals, and then we have a partnership with, uh, it's called the Sunday Breakfast Mission uh, in, in Delaware. And so um, what we do is if we can't re repurpose the food, um, then we will break, break it down and pack it up and you know make sure that it gets to the breakfast mission, and we feed probably 500 people. They feed about 500 people a day. It's in, in Wilmington, Delaware, it's, um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of poverty and a lot of hungry people, children, so uh, we always make sure that um, nothing really go nothing goes to waste if we can if we can avoid it. It's got it. Somebody can consume it, and that's what we focus on. So matter it's matter of planning. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Well, um, before we um, end the session, and we've we've taken uh, so much time for just going through this menu that we're not going to do the the second bit, but we are going to do the vote for <laughs> whose <laughs> whose menu you think is the most. <laughs> Uh, sustainable and the most inclusive menu. So, Clara, could you bring up the vote? You can go to slido.com and you will, if you go to um, the page where it says IAC meeting room, you will see this post coming up, poll coming up, and okay, with one person voting, it's obvious that <laughs> Murray gets 100%, <laughs> and things are uh, starting to get balanced out there now with two people 50 50. Good. Let's see how far we get. We've got about 30 people, so we'll give you some more time to vote until we reach a stage where there is a point of no return. Because <laughs> now each single vote is still changing the percentages significantly. Okay. Anybody still waiting to vote? <coughs> you can't get into the thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, but I think the the even now with some more votes, it's pretty clear that the winner is Felix. <laughs> well done. <All> right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. That is the most inclusive menu for, uh, for this morning. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having been with us. Uh, two more things before you leave. So two more things, actually, two. Um, one is the food over there. You can try some of the things that we've been talking about. Amaranth seeds, for instance, which may be new to some people, are there. Lots of ingredients. Felix and Murray are more than happy to explain everything that's up there. And there's the little survey that we asked you to fill out. There's questions one and two that are outstanding. We're really interested in having your opinions on, on those issues. Um, and it adds into uh, IX Meeting Room of the Future Research with this sort of live component of it. We were getting about 14, 15 groups, 30 people at the time. That's a very sizable research population. So we're really happy to have your opinion on these issues. 
and will continue to inform uh, our industry of, uh, of everybody's ideas on trends that are ongoing. Thank you very much for having been with us and hope to see you back in another session.